Okay. I'll just uh, wait a second for folks to join in and uh, I'll get started. Let's see here. Make sure that the live is working and the flux capacitor is flexing. Um, okay, so it looks like we have some folks joining in, so welcome. Um, I have some really, really cool stuff to show you today. And again, I say that every week because it's true. We got some really cool stuff here. Um, so let's dive right in. Uh, but first, uh, I want to ask you, I'm going to show you this. And I want to ask you, okay, let me show you these. It's a pair of candlesticks, right? Wood candlesticks, seemingly benign, doesn't look like much, doesn't look like a big deal. Um, so see if you could tell me, oh, hey, Dave, see if you could tell me what uh, interesting story might be about these candlesticks. And I'll give you a hint. Okay, it has to do with the White House, and it has to do with the years 1814 and 1927. So if you could think of those two years in the White House, and then I'll get back to these uh, uh, at, later on, and I'll tell you what they are. So think about that as we go along, and let's continue. So um, something I wanted to show you and to just talk about is we have this really cool presentation that's going to be happening uh, June 11th um, at 5.30 p.m., on Facebook Live, we're going to have Discovering the President, which is uh, a panel discussion on James Monroe with award-winning author Tim McGrath. Um, and so actually there's a picture of him here. Uh, there's Tim McGrath. He's going to be great. Um, so we really hope that you can join us for that. It's going to be fantastic. Oh, hey, Ka hi, Mike. How are you? Hey, David. I'm so glad you can join. Okay, so let me show you this. This is really, really cool. Uh, let me pull this in. Let me see if I can very gently sort of bring it up and over and show you this okay look at that what do we got here all right so what is this what's going on is this is this a banjo um well no uh but it kind of looks like one right it's sort of an interesting thing this is actually a barometer okay um let me let me hold it up even closer can you see this can you see sort of the markings on here and if i kind of go up and down all right you can see that um, this is a brown Cersei, 18, 1805, um, 1810, around there somewhere. And this was made by a guy named Cordy over in England. And this belonged to James Monroe. And so you ask yourself, well, why a barometer? Why would James Monroe have a barometer? Um, well, it's sort of interesting. You know, in, in, in the 1780s, there became sort of this influx of Italian craftsmen into both England and France that actually started creating, uh, they, they sort of stylized barometers and they, they created them to be more fancy. I mean, you know, before then barometers, they weren't sort of as compact as they are now or, or as they are in this point. And, you know, because barometers, uh, they were more or less invented, what, around uh, 1643, I think it was something like that. And, uh, you know, there were these giant tubes, you know, a mercury barometer. How does that work exactly? Well, it measures barometric pressure, right? Which, you know, one unit is equal to about 14 and a half uh, pounds uh, per square inch of barometric pressure, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, you know, you know, before, you know, they would be these sort of big old clunky things. And, you know, they, if you have like a, a tube of mercury and you have the, uh, the tube going down into the reservoir and then the barometric pressure can be measured by the mercury pressure as it goes up and down in elevation relevant to the pressure in the atmosphere. You know, blah, 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 you know, I, you know, okay, so what? Well, what does it have to do with this? Well, in the 1780s, you know, they started this influx of, of, of Italian immigrants into England and France and started creating this sort of more craftsman-like and beautiful utilitarian, uh, or, not utilitarian, but you know, beautiful, like decorative, in a way, barometers. And so it was sort of a way for gentlemen in, uh, of, the, of the upper classes to sort of show off a little bit that they were into science and into scientific knowledge and things like that. So a good way to do that is to be, oh, hey, Chris, hey, Tippy. So a good way to do that is to have a nice, you know, good looking barometer hanging on your wall. And that's exactly what this is. Um, so if you look really closely, this is really cool. Can you see this inlay going on here? This sort of pattern inlay. It's almost like a, almost like a rose pattern or, you know, just sort of an outward pattern there. You see that? So that's really cool. That, that's an inlay. You know how they do that? What they do, that's not actually, that's not actually a different colors. They didn't color the wood differently. That's actually different pieces of wood that are inlaid into the barometer itself. So 
what they would do, how they would do that is, okay, so say you had the surface of the barometer like this, right? You had the surface of the wood and you would carve the piece and indent into the wood itself. And then you would place this um, with, and then you would place the wood into their different color wood so that it would contrast with the other. And then you would sand that flush. So it's not actually, they would inlay it and then sort of leave that. They would inlay it and then usually sand it flush. So that way it creates a sort of a uh, flat pattern. Whereas like in a tile mosaic, right, you would put the tiles in and land them that next year, but you're not necessarily sanding it down or, or, or finishing it down. It's more layered there. But with the wood inlay that you could do that and sand in there. And that's how they do that with purfling as well. Um, I don't know if you can see, but it's probably really hard to see. Can you see the purfling around the outside? That sort of edge that's around the outside? Can you see that? Um, that's called purfling. And they do that in the same way, where they actually inlay it into the wood and then it sort of sand is down. Um, oh, Amanda Ellen, yeah, it was popular. Yeah, very, very popular. You're seeing that a lot in a lot of the furniture, in a lot of the decorative items. You see that sort of pattern inlay. Um, veneers, you know, wood veneers, where like if they would have a piece of furniture made out of cheaper wood on the inside and then veneer on the outside so that the veneer would make it look, you know, fancier and a little bit more, a little bit more upscale. So that's kind of a similar thing. Um, you see, you know, you see that a lot, this sort of purfling on the outside. You see that in violins, right? Have you ever seen violins? Um, so, you know, you still see, you still see that many, many times today. That's something that sort of still happens. But anyway, this was sort of a kind of an interesting way for them to show off the mercury. This is also known as a, a Torricellian vacuum, um, which this, this particular mercury barometer it measures barometric pressure it was a way to show off you know that you were interested in science and it was also a nice sort of decoration so you hang this on the wall sort of like a banjo looking thing right sort of hanging on the wall and have it hanging there so that's kind of an interesting little little piece of piece of history there so let me put this aside and let me pull out these candlesticks again okay ready so these pair of candlesticks that you see here Wood candlesticks. And I asked you before, what would the what would be the story of these wood candlesticks? They 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 look like nothing, right? Just like something, honestly, something that you might find at Walmart or something like that. You know, no big deal. Just you know, nice pair of candlesticks. They're longleaf pine, which our friends in North Carolina would know all about. Longleaf pine. They're, they're everywhere down there. So, in order for me to answer that question of of what's what's interesting about these, uh, so let me tell you a story. Okay, so in eighteen fourteen. Right, the British burned the White House. Okay, they came in. Honestly, it was a devastating defeat for the fledgling young country. You know, we were doing all right, and, 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 and you know, we we're sort of sort of finding our feet. Then the British come in and they burned Washington and, and they they burned the White House. Now, contrasting what contrary to what a lot of a lot of people think, the the, the, the back then the president's house, but. It didn't actually burn down to ash completely, where it was complete ash on the ground. So it wasn't like there was nothing there, just a big hole. They didn't actually raise it completely, but they burned it significantly, but they could restore it. Okay, so they could restore the president's house, what would become the White House. And that's what they did. They restored it. They rebuilt after that devastating loss. So, you know, you had this big national tragedy happening, and but they continued on. It still stood, sort of. And they restored it. And James Monroe was a big part of that restoration. In fact, he was one of the folks that that ordered a lot of the new furniture to come in to fill up the fill up the the president's house, the White House. And um, so he was an integral part of that. Okay. Fast forward to 1924, well over 100 years later. Okay. Fast fast forward to 1924, or actually, let's say, forgive me, 1923. Okay. President Harding dies. Your, your, your Grace Coolidge, you suddenly become First Lady of the United States. Grace Coolidge, you know, she's a very vivacious woman. You know, she was 44 years old at the time, three years younger than me, becomes First Lady. Um, she was a very visual person, uh, outgoing. Um, her, her entertainment of guests was, was very well received. Um, she was one of the first persons to, to, to one of the, I think she, maybe she was the first lady to speak on audio news reels, audio reels. Um, and she becomes first lady in, in 1923. A year later, 1924, her son, who was also named Calvin, uh, you know, because you have Calvin Coolridge, uh, her, her, obviously her husband, the president of the United States, 
uh, her son was playing tennis, okay? And her son playing in tennis school and gets a blister on his, on his, on his foot. No big deal. Get a, get a blister on his foot. But the, back then, you know, things were a little different. His, his blister goes septic, okay? Develops blood poisoning. And he ends up dying two days later. So just a year in of being first lady, suddenly your son dies um, of a blister infection after playing tennis. Devastating, right? Completely devastating. Uh, by all accounts, a lot of people say that Calvin Coolidge actually went into a bit of depression, um, sort of withdrew a little bit, stiffened up a little bit. Um, oh, hey, look, sort of stiffened up a little bit. Uh, but Grace Coolidge, um, she was really strong, a strong woman. She kept going, uh, you know, devastated, obviously, but um, she sort of threw herself into projects, into different projects. Uh, she was very interested in White House history. She was very interested in the artifacts in the White House. And one of the things that they had to do at the time, they were up on the top floors and they, they needed to restore it, okay? Because you're getting really old. The, the, the timbers up there were getting old. They were from the, the restoration after the 1814 burning of the White House. So these timbers were up there for all those years, well over a century. And they're starting to go, they're starting to rot. And in fact, the story is, that when they brought Calvin Coolidge up to look at the timbers um, and say, you know, we got to restore these, he said, okay, but restore them, but send the bill to England because, you know, they're the ones that burned, <laughs> they're the ones that burned the White House in the first place. So we're sending them the bill. You know, that's the story. But anyway, so she throws herself into these different projects. And one of the things was this restoration. If I'm not mistaken, they got $500,000 from, from Congress to restore the White House. And to get those those things. And the story is that it's one of those things that helped her in her grieving process, if that makes sense. You know, I mean, I can't even imagine a loss like that. And, you know, but something that, you know, apparently helped her was these projects like this, restorations, giving her new hope, uh, you know, giving her, keeping her busy. And so the restoration of the White House, you know, was one of those things, by all accounts, or by the story. And at the time, uh, Coolridge had these wood. He knew about the James Monroe. They, you know, they knew about the James Monroe Museum and the legacy of James Monroe, and they knew that he was one of the folks that helped restore the White House hundred years earlier, well over hundred years earlier. So Coolridge sends the James Monroe Museum, uh, Lawrence Hose, at the time he sent, sends the James Monroe Museum this pair of candlesticks that were turned from the original timbers from the White House. And those original timbers were part of the restoration project that James Monroe was a big part of overseeing. So I love that because these are seemingly innocuous objects. They don't look like anything, anything, but it has a story. These things have stories. This material culture has stories. You know, do me a favor, look around you right now and look at stuff that's, that's there and look at something that might be completely seem innocuous, seem pointless, benign, you know, it's like no big deal. But really think about it and think about what that story of that object is, where it came from, who made it, what that says about you, that artifact. And so the material culture is part of all this. So what's the story of these candlesticks? The story to me is hope. Hope because in the, after the burning of 1814, everything seemed devastated. But they rebuilt, they restored, and they went on. In 1920s, 1927, and when the restoration of the White House, a grieving mother, restoration, giving hope, and going on, moving on. So the story of these candlesticks to me is hope. And no matter how bad things get, there is always hope. How do I know that? Because you can find hope in the small, little, seemingly benign, everyday things. That's how I know. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate it. If you want to go to our Facebook page and give it a like, that would be great. Um, if you want to become a friend of the James Monroe Museum and help our cause a little bit, that would be wonderful too. So please... 
join in. Thanks for joining me and we'll see you next time.